Whoa. <laughs> I am a completely different person than the girl you've seen before, okay? I'm a mother. I don't know if I'm in focus. I don't know if the shot is like straight. I have no idea. I don't know what I'm doing, okay? All I know how to do these days is pump <laughs> and breastfeed. Um, it's pretty much all I think about and it consumes all of my time. But I wanted to sit down today and finally share my birth story. I am now nine weeks postpartum. Tommy, our little son, is officially here, obviously. He is nine weeks old. And there's so many things that I have not caught you up on. I think my last like long form video, because I do post YouTube shorts pretty frequently. Um, I haven't in a couple weeks, but more frequently than I post these. Um, and I think the last one I shared was just my pregnancy announcement. So the amount of things that have happened. And if you follow me on any other social media platforms, you probably know the gist of things like the complications that I had during the pregnancy, my hospital stay towards the end, and then uh, like some, some of my postpartum journey. But I haven't actually talked much about that last part, which is what I'm going to talk about today. Just how it's happened and where I'm at now. Um, but because I haven't shared the complications and stuff here, I kind of want to do that. And I'll do so pretty quickly because I do feel like the majority of you probably know, but woo, I do feel like a different person than the one who has sat down and talked to you before. This is coconut water, which is basically all I drink these days. I hear it helps with breast milk. Couldn't tell you. I drink it anyways. It's delicious. So it's expensive as hell, but I also want to take a brief moment for today's sponsor, which is Natural Cycles. <laughs> Natural Cycles is an app that I used to plan my pregnancy and spoiler alert, um, it worked. I did get pregnant, but it is an FDA cleared hormone free, non-invasive birth control app. So you can use it to prevent pregnancy, to plan your pregnancy. Like I said, that's what I used. And now you can use it after your pregnancy as well for your postpartum journey. And that's been really exciting, a new feature because I am currently in the postpartum phase of of the experience. And so I can have some mental health check-ins and just daily check-ins. It kind of gives you some resources for yourself and for your partner. How the app works, it essentially every morning you'll wake up and you'll take your temperature. Uh, with the code that I'm gonna give you, it's gonna get you 15% off the annual subscription, but also a free thermometer. So you can use the free thermometer uh, to check your temperature in the morning. You can use an Aura Ring or a compatible Apple Watch as well. You'll do that first thing in the morning and then you'll check the app to see your fertility status and kind of take control of your cycle. Like I mentioned, that will get you 15% off. I believe the code is divine. I'll put it right here. 15% um, off the annual subscription and then a free thermometer as well if you do not have one of those other devices. Uh, thank you so much to Natural Cycles for sponsoring this video. It's a very fitting sponsor for this particular topic. Where does one begin? I think in the last video I posted I want to say it was like first trimester or like the end of my first trimester. I know I was getting ready in the front seat doing my makeup and I think I was just telling you like I was pregnant. And so essentially what happened after that is um, at my 20 week anatomy scan, like I said, I will make this fast. If you already know this story, I promise you can skip ahead a little bit, but it is crucial to my birth story. It's essential actually to the entire birth story. So if you don't know, I have to tell this part. Um, Basically, at my 20-week anatomy scan, I was told that I had a velamentous cord insertion, which basically means that you're, you have a placenta right inside of your belly, and the placenta has a very meaty part with a lot of the nutrients for the baby, and Tommy is my son's name, so I'm going to refer to him as Tommy this whole time. Uh, Tommy's umbilical cord should plug into the placenta, and it is supposed to plug into that really meaty part. And his umbilical cord was kind of plugged in off to the side into a thin part of the placenta, so there was way less nutrients that he was receiving, but he was still growing and he, it was okay. He was receiving enough nutrients, but with velamentous cord insertion, sometimes you can develop vasa previa, which is much more serious. And that is what I ended up having. So at my 20 week anatomy scan, everything's go, you know, she's going through, basically they do your whole, like the whole baby, the liver, the kidneys, the, this, 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 they want to make sure everything, the, uh, the different chambers of the heart, uh, the lobes of the brain, like all these different things. And when she was kind of examining the surroundings, the fluid, she saw what she thought was vasa previa. So she had a doctor come in, confirm it. They had to do the transvaginal ultrasound as well, just to confirm it. Um, and basically what vasa previa is, 
is there is a fetal blood vessel. I'm trying to explain this as simply as I can, but it also, it's a little bit complex, I guess. There is a fetal blood vessel. So there is a blood vessel that is um, Tommy's blood supply and very important to his, like, well be his life, essentially. Um, it's supposed to be inside of the umbilical cord and his was out, outside of the umbilical cord. So it was exposed. It was just kind of free floating where it should have that protection of the umbilical cord. And not only was it exposed, but it was laying directly across my cervix. And that's kind of where the severity of the situation is. If my cervix was to start dilating towards the end of my pregnancy, which is very common, it can cause that blood vessel to rupture. And Essentially, if the blood vessel ruptures, you really only have, like, I want to say, the doctor told me, like, less than five minutes to save the baby's life because the baby would essentially bleed out, which I know is, that's a terrifying, terrifying conversation, but that is what they told us. And they said to avoid that happening, I could not have contractions. I could not risk my cervix dilating for any reason. So I was put on pelvic rest. I was not allowed to work out. I was not on bed rest, but I had to take things very gently for the rest of my pregnancy, starting at 20 weeks. And then at 28 weeks, I was going to have to start going into the doctor a couple times a week. They would measure my cervix, make sure that it looked good. And if it did, I could push back hospitalization to 32 weeks, which is what I ended up doing. And at 32 weeks, I had to be hospitalized for the rest of my pregnancy to make sure that the baby was okay, to make sure that my cervix was not dilating, make sure I was not having contractions. If I were to have a contraction, if that uh, blood vessel was to rupture, like I said, I needed to be within a hundred yards of, if not less, I was way hundred feet, I should say, from an OR. And so basically if I said nurse button, I'm bleeding, they would run me to the OR and it would be an emergency C-section. And so that's kind of just the terrifying part of vasoprevia. But I, in my soul, like I don't know how to explain it, felt that he was going to be okay. Like I genuinely felt that way. And I know like, you know, things could have gone bad and then I would have maybe felt naive. I don't know. But I just, I, I deep down felt like I was going to meet my baby and he was going to be okay. So whereas Henry was really nervous for the rest of my pregnancy, I felt fairly comfortable and confident that Tommy was going to be here and he was going to be okay. So I was hospitalized at 32 weeks. Like I said, they want you to basically have the rest of your pregnancy in the hospital to be close to the OR just in case. And then at 35 weeks, I was going to have a planned C-section. They only let you go to about 35 weeks because of everything I've explained. They do not want you going into labor. If your body starts preparing for labor, it could be very bad. So they used to never let you go past 34 weeks, but because I was in the hospital, they did let me go to 35, which I'm super grateful for. So I was in the hospital for 22 days pre-C-section, which if you're curious, it's super boring, but I basically just viewed it as like, this is my long-term hospital stay, or sorry, my long-term hotel stay. And Henry like decked out my room. I had a little mini fridge. He brought in rugs. I had these fuzzy blankets, pillows, like lights. I had all kinds of stuff in there. All the nurses were, were like, dude, you've moved in. And I, it felt like a, a dorm room, like a freshman dorm room. And that made it so much more like cozy and comfortable. Henry came in every single day and just visited for a few hours. There was a like a couch that he could sleep on, but he was in the vans. Oh, hi, I should probably say this. Yeah, we bought a house. You already know that in Joshua Tree, but there is no like high risk hospital out in Joshua Tree. It just doesn't really exist. So we chose to do all of this in San Diego. So I was at UCSD Jacobs Medical Center. That is the hospital I was at. And so we were actually living in the vans after that 20 week anatomy scan. Basically, we basically just moved to San Diego in the vans. And then when I was hospitalized, Henry stayed in his van in San Diego with the dogs while I was in the hospital. So that's, I guess, a very important part of the story. Um, and so he slept in his van each night because it's like his own space in his van versus like this very uncomfortable couch in the antepartum rooms. Um, and so he would come visit. Eventually we were able to get our dogs into my room. We would just bring one dog every day, but that was also amazing because I had gone the first few weeks without seeing them at all. And especially with Pearl, like Ella loves Henry. She probably prefers him. Honestly, she's obsessed with him. Finn obsessed with Henry. That's his dog. Uh, but Pearl is like, 
attached to me and so I just that's my chihuahua and I just missed her so much and I knew she was like missing me a lot and so having her come in the room a few times was really great for both of us and so I met all the nurses I had like a hundred nurses it's a huge hospital I loved every single one of them and I had a great doctor shout out to Dr. Sarker at UCSD he is phenomenal and Dr. Thomas Kelly he also performed my c-section with Dr. Sarker um, and they just did such a great job. Everybody made me feel so comfortable. And every time I saw a familiar face, they were all so nice. And it just, they made the 22 days feel just better in general. I mean, it was still boring, but with Vesa Previa, the goal is that you have the most boring stay ever until your planned C-section. Like you don't want to be rushing down the hall wondering if your baby's going to be okay obviously and just you know an emergency c-section is such a different vibe than it being planned so the goal was that it stay boring and boring it was and so every day they put these monitors on me it would monitor the baby's heart rate my belly if i was having contractions things like that fast forward to july 12th this was my planned c-section i want to say i was admitted on june 22nd june 20th something like that um, around that time and then on July 12th we woke up bright and early I knew I was having my baby that day um, and it was just so good to finally have even though I was very optimistic my entire pregnancy it just felt so good to have that weight like coming off of my shoulders I knew that once he was here there's no risk at all the Vesa Previa does not matter my life was never at risk and so I just knew the moment he's born this is all like not a problem obviously because then he just is relying on like earth and he's not his blood supply is not coming from my the umbilical cord anymore basically and so that just felt that just felt amazing to wake up that day being like okay we're a couple hours away and I had intentionally requested that my c-section be at nine o'clock in the morning because that was the earliest one they had and I did not want to have to starve myself all day because starting at midnight the day before any surgery I think they you have to start fasting and I did not want to fast so I ate at like 11 50 I mean I was eight and a half months pregnant I was ravenous and so I could not imagine not eating and so Basically, I started fasting at midnight. I woke up at like six and Henry came into the hospital. My mom had already flown into San Diego at this point because we needed someone to watch the dogs for at least a handful of days. So my mom flew in, she had the dogs. Henry came in at six in the morning. We're talking, we're like, you know, obviously freaking out. We're having a baby today. Like our firstborn baby is going to be here in a few hours. And that's just a crazy feeling. It also, was kind of nice in all honesty just knowing when you're having your baby like versus going into like a vaginal birth or something you just have no idea when that's gonna happen you're kind of at the edge of your seat towards the end of a pregnancy and it just kind of felt nice to be like hmm, it's happening today at nine and so the doctors you know came in a few hours early explained to me what things were gonna look like and I think around like 8.30, we had what was called a huddle and the nurses that would be in the room came in, the doctors that would be there, Dr. Sarker and Dr. Kelly, and the NICU team was gonna be there, the anesthesiologist, everyone who would be in the room came into my antepartum room to just talk to me and have like, like I said, they called it a huddle and they basically just wanted to make sure I was the correct patient. I had Vesa Previa. This is why this is what's going on any allergies like you get on the same page so everyone is aware of everything also appreciated that felt like it was necessary so around 8 30 we do that everybody's like okay we're ready to rock of course to them they're just this is like another c-section but to me i'm like oh my god and so they all leave my room and at around like 8 45 8 50 one of the nurses came in and she was like hey you ready like let's we're gonna walk down there they offer if you want to walk or take a wheelchair and i just wanted to walk i knew that i was gonna have to probably be like wheelchaired around and stuff afterwards and so i just was like i just wanted to walk down into the or so i walk in and i just want to prepare anyone who's gonna have a c-section the first 10 or 15 minutes in that room is truly the most stressful like it is you basically nothing's happening all morning right like i'm just sitting around i'm so nervous i think i like went to the bathroom 100 times because i was literally so nervous tmi but it's kind of what was happening and i was just petrified 
not of even having a baby, just of like the surgery. Like, what is this going to be like? You have no idea. You have no, there's no comparison. You've never had a similar experience. And anytime I've been in an OR, which has only been a couple times, I was under general anesthesia. Also, fun fact, I have a scar on my arm from the IV that I had from the entire 22 days. And then until I left the hospital, so 26 days total, I had an IV in my arm. And I just want to say that was the worst part of being hospitalized. They had to have it in my arm because if I was going to be rushed down to the OR because of an emergency, that would have just been a minute or two that they couldn't waste. Like they wanted to be able to plug in the general anesthesia and get my ass into the OR. So they walk me into the OR that day and everyone's kind of getting ready. And it felt like as soon as I sat down on the bed, basically the anesthesiologist had me sit down and curl my back for the spinal tap. And so I kind of curled my back and it just felt as soon as I did that and she was putting it in, somebody's grabbing my left arm, someone's grabbing my right arm. They're putting stuff in this, they're connecting this, they're doing, they're like someone's grabbing my head like everyone is just touching me and then they you know uh once the spinal tap was in they turned my body laid me out onto the table they start putting the curtain up and testing my body henry's not in the room yet he was like kind of putting on the suit that the partner wears whoever's going to be in the room with you and so i'm by myself that was also kind of attributing to that 15 minutes of like chaos and overstimulation i just didn't have like an anchor in the room with me and so i'm laying down they start cleaning me and kind of like telling me what's going on and then my doctor walks in and i was like I, I my doctor walked in and started like touching my legs and telling me like do you feel this if you know if you if you feel xyz tell us if you feel this whatever and i felt like he was starting the surgery and so i remember looking up and being like wait a second wait like is henry coming is henry on his way i felt like for a minute that they had forgotten about henry which was not true they were like oh yeah nothing nothing's happening yet we're just making sure that the spinal tap is working and everything is good to go and then like right after saying that henry walks into the room and of course both of us the energy is so high also one of the anesthesiologists bless i feel like the 22 days leading up the nurses really do like the lord's work like they're just they're everything to me right those, those 22 days it was the nurses that i developed relationships with and stuff but in the surgery the anesthesiologists that were sitting behind me they were absolutely everything they were it was two women which i loved and they were just stroking my hair the whole time and as soon as i walked in when one of them was doing the spinal tap, the other one said, do you have any music that you want to play? And I had been told one million times to do a playlist. And I just never did. I was like, I don't know. Like, what am I going to play? What, you know, compares to that moment? Like, what am I going to play in that moment? And so I just never created a playlist. And the anesthesiologist was like, you got to have a playlist. We're, we're going to play music. Like, what do you what do you love? And I was like, in the moment, which I do love Billie Eilish, but in the moment I just was like, Billie Eilish, I don't know. And so she just put on Billie Eilish. And I said, if you can play Birds of a Feather when he's being born, I would really love that. And she was like, okay, we'll do our best. Spoiler alert, she did. We love her. The Billie Eilish music is playing. Henry's now sitting next to me. And they kind of say, we're ready to go. Um, you know, everything's all good. Start. They start slicing. Um, and the thing with C-sections is that you can feel pressure which this will never make sense unless you experience it because i had heard this and i was like what does it mean you can feel pressure but you can't feel pain and so i can feel they would even say lots of pressure lots of pressure and i just would feel like they had cut open my c-section like scar that tissue and I could feel them up right below my chest shoving the baby down and out and I could feel just like pressure like it felt like their whole body weight was shoving the baby out of my body and so that was just a wild experience and so eventually I feel them get him out it felt like it took a long time like it probably took 20 minutes and the you can't really hear there's just so much going on there's like loud machines and stuff I could tell that something was not wrong, but that like something was off, something was bizarre. And so I kept asking the anesthesiologist, like, is everything okay? Cause she would stand and look over the curtain. And I was like, is everything okay? Something seems wrong. Like the energy on the other side of the curtain seemed more chaotic than I would have expected for people who do it all the time. And 
So I just was like, is everything okay? She was like, no, 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 everything is fine. Um, Tommy is about to like be born. And I was like, oh my God. And so Henry's stroking my hair. She turns on birds of a feather. And so as soon as I heard that song, I was like, oh my God, this, <laughs> this is this is happening and so they have an option in the curtain to basically lift up like this middle section and when they lift it up there's a clear section and you can see through like what's going on and it's such a monumental moment that you really at least I did it didn't look at all at like my body like I don't remember anything seeing any like surgical or open body I only remember seeing when they lifted it I saw Tommy and I couldn't see him at first. I was like, my head was down um, and I just like couldn't see right. And so I was like, I can't see, I can't see. And Henry lifts my head up and I just see Tommy. And he immediately, he's five weeks early, just starts screaming. And I, that is like, I mean, I know you've heard it before, but it's the best feeling in the entire world because now Beza Previ is gone. Tommy's, I could literally cry talking about this. Tommy's born. I'm with Henry. It was just like, I mean, it's, it's single-handedly the most intense day and moment of your whole life. Like nothing would ever compare to that. And so he's crying. I honestly have told this story and I, I do not ever get emotional, but it was the, it was the coolest thing. It was the coolest thing ever. And so, uh, as soon as he was born, they take him kind of away to assess him. And Henry, I, Henry's like, can I go over there? I said, I, of course, like, go over. And so the NICU team comes back over. I think it was just two, two girls and two women. And they came over and they said, um, he does need to go to the NICU. He's just, like totally healthy. He's doing great. And he's actually breathing on his own. But there, I, I don't recall, there was like a pressure issue with his breathing or something. So he did need to be put on the CPAP. Um, and so she said, I'm going to bring him over and put him next to you, but it, it can only be for like a second. And I was like, okay. Um, which was to be expected. Like we waited to 35 weeks hoping he wouldn't go to the NICU, but I had mentally prepared for the fact that he most likely was going to go. And so, uh, she brings Tommy over and obviously at this point too, your heart has like burst open, but you don't know this baby. And I had, I had never had a baby. So I, it was like, you know, I don't know this person. <laughs> it's like kind of what it felt like. I, I've heard, we talked to someone right before I had Tommy and they were like the moment we heard our daughters cry in our C-section, it was like, we'd known her our entire lives. And like, as amazing as my experience was, I didn't feel that way. Like when they were holding him up against my cheek, I was like, I don't know what to do. <laughs> like, I, I didn't feel, I didn't say that, but in my head I was kind of like, tee -hee, <laughs> cute. I don't know you. I don't know what's going on here. And, um, and it's just so overwhelming. And so they put his cheek next to mine and I kissed him. And I remember thinking like, am I allowed to kiss him? Because you're just typically told like not to kiss babies. And so I kissed him and I was like, but he's my baby. So now I kiss him all the time, but I like kissed his cheek. And I remember being like, oh my God, was that okay? And so then she was like, you know, we have to take him away, whatever. And so Henry goes with him and he checks with me again. He was such a supportive partner. He was just like, is it okay if I go? I was like, yes, please go with him. And this is a moment that I had been dreading since finding out I was going to have a C-section, finding out about Vasa Previa. I'd been dreading the moment that Henry would leave the OR. Tommy would go to the NICU and Henry would go with him. And I would be left there by myself with just like a doctor stitching me up. I just... I expected it to feel so lonely and just like, like I'm without my baby, you know, and how messed up is that going to be? Like that's, that just sounds so effed, right? Well, Henry leaves, Tommy's out. I'm assuming it was just the weight of the complications and all these things, like just completely being gone. I took the largest sigh of relief. Like the doctors start coming over and there, one of them explained to me why the energy was like chaotic. I totally got derailed by the way. Sorry. I'm, I'm living on like four or five hours of sleep. So if this story is all over the place, it just is what it is. Um, but the reason that the energy was chaotic, the doctor did explain was that this is a crazy thing to say. I'm like embarrassed every time I say it out loud because it feels like such a lie. I'm not someone who works out <laughs> like ever, honestly, I eat pretty healthy and I'm like an active person, but I don't ever work out. And the doctor said that my abdominal muscles 
were so strong that they had a really difficult time pushing him out. And so they could not get him out. They ended up having to use forceps, which I had personally, I don't have much like context around C-sections, but I'd never heard of it. And so that was kind of why the energy had sh like not shifted. It was never scary, but I actually, it was a little scary for a minute because I just felt like, I mean, you don't want anything to be wrong. And I definitely felt like something was going on. Um, and so, but he said, everything's totally fine. Tommy's doing great. He's going to the NICU. You know that you're doing great. You're going to be stitched up. Um, but it was just a really hard time trying to get him out. I get stitched up. Henry leaves. Like I said, I had been dreading this moment and people are kind of starting to shuffle out. And I felt incredible. I felt like I, I could have slept for a hundred hours in that moment. Little did I know I would never sleep for another hour, but I felt like, like that's just this, I felt slumped, you know, like I just was like, Oh, thank God. Everyone's okay. Everyone is doing great. Everyone's thriving. What more could you ask for? And so after the surgery was done, they take you to recovery. I sat in a recovery room with a bunch of other people who had just had babies, but there was curtains in between each one, but I could like hear them. And I will say that was like probably the more sad moment is that they all had their babies and I did not. Like it was, you know, a few people who had had C-sections that day. And so I could hear their babies crying and things like that. And I didn't have my baby. So that was like a little depressing. Um, and so I sat in recovery for two hours. They come and check you every 15 minutes, your vitals, make sure you're good after, you know, everything that you've just gone through physically. And everything was fine with me. Henry came into the recovery room once he saw Tommy get settled in the NICU. In between my recovery room and the postpartum room I was going to be in, they basically had moved all that antepartum stuff I had up a floor to the postpartum floor. And uh, in between going there, they brought me to the NICU. And so I got to actually meet Tommy. He did have the CPAP on and like all these different wires, which was of course very intimidating, but they let me hold him and just spend like 20 minutes with him, which was so incredible. I did skin to skin and he just looked like that. He was five pounds and 14 ounces when he was born. And he was five pounds, four ounces when we left the hospital. It's normal for babies to lose weight, but he did lose like they, I think they say they can lose like 10% of their body weight and he did lose 10% of his body weight. So that was like, he's like right on the verge. Um, but five pounds, 14 ounces, he was such a small little nugget. He was so cute. You couldn't really see much of his face with the CPAP on, but it just felt good to like touch him and hold him. And then I went up to postpartum and we kind of sat there for a few hours just talking about like what was going on. And then basically I just had to wait for a nurse to come check me and, you know, get settled before we could go down and like really spend time in the NICU. And before we even got back down to the NICU, they took him off the CPAP and he was on room air and he was like, doing really well. They did say that he was going to have to stay overnight in the NICU uh, just to be monitored, but that he was already improving and that he would most likely be transferred to my room uh, very quickly. And so that was, I, I cannot even tell you how amazing that felt. Even when he went to the NICU, I just assumed he'd be there for at least until I was discharged. I ended up staying for four days and I assumed he might be able to come with us when we were discharged, but little did I know he'd be in our room much faster than that. And so once we went down to the NICU, we got to hang with him and he had a CPAP off so we could see his little face. His eyes were all bruised from the forceps. That was so sad. Um, and honestly, there actually is nine weeks later still bruising on one of his eyelids. We just got to hold him. They had him latch onto me and that was the craziest thing ever. He like latched immediately. And I just was not expecting that because he was so early. Um, and we've since had some issues. That's a story for another day, but uh, he is getting breast milk still, which is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. We ended up just spending as much time as possible down there. It actually was, I would never wish the NICU on anyone, but it was silver lining, kind of nice for that night, like to not have him and to sleep. And so basically Henry and I would just sleep for a few hours and then we would go see him. We'd sleep for a few hours and then we would go see him. And that's kind of just what we did for the first I think he was there for like 18 hours. But the next morning they brought him up and he was officially with us. They still monitored him like very closely. They basically come into, they came into my room every couple hours and they would check my vitals, check his vitals and just make sure he was okay. And then four days later, we left and we came home to Joshua Tree. And that was, I, that might've been crazier than the day of the C-section, to be honest. It just, you're leaving a hospital with a, f at that time, a five pound baby. It was so terrifying. He had to do a car seat test the day that we left. 
and that was my one negative experience at this hospital. I have nothing but amazing things to say about UCSD. This one woman came in that day and we were being discharged. Everyone was like, we, I, I was giving, I was given discharge papers by my nurse. We are leaving. And this one, but we knew that we had to do this car seat test, but it hadn't been made out to be that big of a deal. Like they acted like he'd pass and they do it with all premature babies at this hospital and it basically they connect him to these machines and uh they just want to see that sitting in a car seat for 90 minutes that his airway remains open and and which is what we want because we knew we were driving home and so it's like a two and a half hour car ride which we ended up stopping along the way anyways but basically right before the car seat test a pediatric nurse came in and was kind of just telling us it was not even worth trying that day. She was like, he should probably, you can be discharged, but you should probably have him admitted to the NICU for one more day and then he can try. Or if you're discharged and we have a room available, like one of these postpartum rooms are available, depending on, you know, how many people are in labor right now, um, then you could actually stay in this room another night under Tommy's like insurance care if that makes any sense. And I was like, okay. And I was like, so it's not, we're not even going to do the car seat test. And I, she didn't really say it like it was an option, but I was so confused. And she just said it so rudely. The first thing she said when she walked into the room was what happened to his eyes? And I was like, they had to use forceps to get him out. And she was like, oh, oh my God. And it just was like, that was her energy the entire time. So sour, so rude. And so she leaves the room and Henry was like, F that woman. Like she, he's going to try. Like, why would we not try? There's no, we can't try. Tommy's not even going to be able to give it a go. And like, if he fails, he fails and we'll do, try it again tomorrow. But why would we not try? And so we ended up going for it. And I was like, yeah, we might as well just try. And so Tommy goes, crushes it. And she also came back into my room before. So Henry was texting me the whole time. I could not go watch the car seat test. Too much anxiety. But Henry was texting me the whole time. He's like, oh my God, he just passed. Like he's doing great, whatever. And so I knew they were on their way back. And she was in the room with them doing the car seat test and she intentionally beat Henry and Tommy back into my room just to say, oh, he passed. He got a little fussy here and there, but he did really well. And I was like, okay, he passed, you know, screw you. And so she leaves and I told that to Henry later on and he was like, Tommy did not be, he wasn't fussy one time. He did not make a peep. He slept for 90 minutes straight and his oxygen was fantastic the entire time. Like that's a bold faced lie. So don't love that. Don't love her. But he passed and we were out of there. Ironically, she was in the elevator with us as we went down to leave the hospital. And I was just staring at her like, how dare you come at my son like this? And so then we left, we drove in Henry's van to an Airbnb in San Diego that night. I just did not feel comfortable driving all the way. Like we, I thought we were going to, but I didn't want to. And so we stayed in an Airbnb that night and the next day we drove home <laughs> and we've just been home ever since. And Tommy's thriving. He's doing great. He's almost 11 pounds now. He's still, I think because he has like pretty intense reflux, which is common with premature babies. My nephew was a month early and he had really bad reflux as well. And so it's just an underdeveloped like digestive system. And because of that, he does have a hard time like drinking straight from the girls and but he tries every day i put him on every single day but he sometimes just spits it up because i think well, my letdown is too strong um but i just want to keep trying so that when, as he gets older and stronger it nursing is so much in my opinion my experience easier than pumping the pumping and bottles is like it's just a lot okay i'm always pumping i'm always feeding especially because i'm nursing pumping and bottle feeding right now it's just like it's kind of around the clock and it definitely is the hardest thing i've ever done but Anyways, that's the birth story. I wish I, Henry has Tommy right now and we're not going to be showing him online at all. That's just kind of a personal choice that we've made. And so because Henry has him, I'm not going to have Henry come in and like share his experience. But one of these days we'll sit down together so that you can hear Henry's version or just his, you know, opinion on fatherhood thus far. But it has been like absolute bliss. Obviously, I'm not sleeping but I would never sleep again if it meant like having Tommy. I always just wondered how, I'd, how I would feel. I knew I would love being a mom, but just because of the things I've heard people say online and stuff, I just was like, is it gonna be like, 
I don't know, not worth it. That sounds terrible. I don't know. I just wanted to know what it, what the experience would be like for me. And I have never been more obsessed with something in my whole life. It feels like my whole identity right now. And I know that that's going to shift and kind of change. I'll find myself again someday. But right now I'm like totally fine with feeling like nothing but a mom. I, my, it's hard to put into words. It's impossible to put into words the feeling that you have when you have a baby. There is no love like it. I thought I loved my dogs that way. <laughs> and I just, I know some people do. And if you're choosing not to have children, fantastic. I totally support that. I love that journey for you. But there is not a love that I have personally ever felt like the love I have for Tommy. It is unconditional, inconceivable. You can't explain it. There's nothing, there's n nothing I can sit here and say that would in any way describe the feeling I have every time I look at him. The first two weeks of postpartum are brutal, uh, just hormonally. And because you're just trying to you're trying to deal with the overwhelming sense of love that you have. It's like actually really, really intense. It's the most intense emotion I've ever felt. And I like didn't know where to put it. I didn't know what to do with it. I would cry every single day because I just didn't know. I was like, am I going to feel this, this intensely for the rest of my life? And while the answer is kind of yes, because I'll always love him that much. I am starting to like get used to that feeling, right? Like I don't cry all day, every day, just looking at him. Although sometimes I do, but it's just, you just feel proud in every moment. Every time he does something, you're just like, oh my God, he's holding his head up now. <laughs> and he's like moving around more. He's so alert in between feedings. The first few weeks, they're just kind of asleep. At least he was. And so just as he does certain things, as he grows, when he hit 10 pounds, that felt like a huge milestone. All of it feels like milestones. Um, I'm very excited to get back into the vans for some road trips and some travel stuff. We are going to do that eventually, but we are right now just still kind of taking it day by day. I'm like fighting for my life through the night and Henry takes him in the mornings and lets me sleep in and we're just kind of getting through day by day, you know, letting him get stronger, just letting him exist, like get used to being a person and, and me being a mom and Henry being a father. So after that adjustment period, once we're feeling good, we will probably take some van trips and turn this boy into, into a van kid, which has always been a dream of mine. He obviously cannot ride in my van cause I'm sitting where a back row would go. Um, and I have this like partition wall and so there's just, it's not feasible for him to ride in here, but Henry did end up getting a third seat just for Tommy. So that's how we took him home in his van. And when we go on road trips, he'll be able to ride with Henry and we'll either only take Henry's van so that I can be, ride in the car with Tommy or we'll take both vans and Henry will get like a camera so that he can see Tommy the whole time. But that's pretty much it. Crazy time, crazy experience. Like I said, I feel like a completely different person than the one who sat down just telling you I was pregnant. I had no idea what I was in for. My C-section recovery has gone really well, actually. I didn't know what that would be like. I was like up and about in the room like that day, like, or the next day. I just was ready to move because I'd been in the hospital for so long. And I think that really, really helped. Once we were home, I like never really thought about it again, honestly. I know some people, their, their bodies just take it a lot harder. It's totally different each experience. But I came home and I was like, did not, I have honestly not thought about my C-section since. So been very grateful for that. But we are just, we're just kind of vibing these days. We're at home. We're on our land. I keep looking out. I'm looking at the big Joshua tree in our yard and the shed that's to the left. And then just the wide open land behind you. And it just feels good every day. It's quiet here. Um, it feels like a great place to kind of sit and relax and rest as much as possible. But more videos to come soon. I'm, I really just wanted to document this for you and for myself, honestly, so I can relive it. The, everyone says you're going to forget like all these moments in the early stages. And so I really want there to be, you know, something kind of documented, I guess, of, of what it was like. So his name is Tommy Finn Friedman. Tommy was just a name that we liked. Finn is our dog's name. That's Henry's, the dog that he had when we met. And I just thought the name was super cute. And of course, very meaningful. And he has Henry's last name. I do not. <laughs> so I do not have the same last name as, as Tommy, which is totally fine with me. I don't care. That is it. Tommy Finn Friedman, my baby. He is here. I am, I am mother. And that is all I feel like right now. Um, and like I said, there's nothing I would rather be. So cheers. Thank you for listening. <laughs>